Great. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining this webinar today. Uh, David Hawkins and myself are going to talk about um, what happened in the last round of US applications, which means that we may be talking deep into the night, um, but we're going to try and keep it to uh, 45 minutes to an hour at the most. But what we're going to try and do is talk a little bit about all the things that people have been concerned about, the things that people have been thinking and talking about, um, especially over the last few weeks when everyone's been getting their decisions and, um, and just talk about the reasons that those sorts of things have happened um, and try and make some predictions for the future. Um, as regular listeners will know, David and I always try to make predictions and, and they're usually wrong. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens this time. So I am going to share my screen in a moment. See if this works. Great, there we go. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about the class of 2025, which is uh, those students who should be going off um, this autumn to start university and graduating in 2025. Um, for those who have got in, fantastic, well done. You should consider yourselves either extremely clever or extremely lucky. Um, and we'll try and work out which one of those two uh, you fall on which side of that you fall on today okay um, so we're going to talk about today about the major changes in the last round um so what happened and um and then what were the reasons for those things happening what that means for students and for schools and we're going to talk about some predictions um for the next round as well and then finally we're going to give some advice for students families and teachers um hopefully a lot of what we will say will make sense. Um, we are going to try and, I mean, I don't think Dave and I are, are renowned for being really subtle, um, but we are going to try and it, it, at least a little bit forcibly try and explain what you really should be thinking about if you want to improve your chances of getting into those American colleges. So what did happen? Um, well, as a lot of people know, there were way more applicants to the US from the UK last year. Um, and I'll show just how many there were in a moment. There were way more applicants to the big name colleges. So those colleges that everyone always thinks of straight away. And I'm gonna see if we can get through a whole presentation without naming them. Um, but uh, unsurprisingly that a lot of people were applying to them, but much more than ever before. Lots and lots of students were put on wait lists. Anecdotally, I think we've all experienced, so when I say we, I mean, Counselors and teachers have experienced lots more people ending up on wait lists this year than ever before. Um, and oversubscribed colleges, so colleges offering more places than we would have expected, or they would have expected. Okay, so let's start at the first one then. More applicants from the UK to the US. Um, it was up 23% in the last round, wasn't that, David? Yeah. And, um, well, let's see if we can try and work out why. Um, I've written four reasons down here, and David might be able to tell me that they're either wrong or that I've missed half a dozen other ones. I, in kind of chronological order, from when we first started experiencing this up to now, first one is UK tuition fees. Tuition fees have been going up for quite a number of years. Um, I remember going to university in the very first year of tuition fees when they were £1,000 a year, and there were quite a lot of protests then. They're now up to what is it, ten thousand pounds a year, roughly in the UK? nine thousand two hundred and fifty. The nominal okay. nominal figure, a nominal figure compared to um, to some other places, but yeah. um, certainly it has. I don't know if you've experienced this, David, but I, I think it's changed the way that people think about education, particularly in terms of what can they get for the money. If you're going to have to pay for education, then it makes sense that people are going to think about where they can get the most for their money. What do you think about that, David? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is it's a more subtle effect than just it costs more because it actually typically doesn't cost more, at least for a home student. I think this interacting with, I know another one of your points, which is Brexit, which is for certain students, the UK has become a much more expensive option. I think that's possibly a little bit responsible for the rise that we've seen. Mm. Um, but I think there's another point on here, which is probably 99% responsible for what it is. So one of the next two points then, um, the next one is test optional. I mean, th this is a very obvious one um, and has clearly had a big effect, uh, not just in the UK, but for the rest of the world and America as well, in terms of where people can apply. Um, 
and and clearly a lot of people have just been able to put applications in when they wouldn't have been able to it's probably worth us just spending a little time talking about what has happened suddenly i think there's there's been for a long time a, a kind of trend towards colleges being more test optional test flexible what that means is that colleges don't necessarily require the sat or act um, but students can still submit it um, if they wanted to um, the what happened in the last year was that there was a very long period without people being able to do any test at all and therefore it was obvious that colleges couldn't require people to do the tests that wouldn't have been fair but I don't think what people predicted was going to happen was that suddenly people were going to be putting in applications to the colleges from left, right and centre, um, where they never would have done before. Um, so do we, do we think this is um, a, a good thing or a bad thing, David, or somewhere in between? Um, I think it's a good thing in terms of the fact that there's a massive body of evidence that the tests are not a, a fair way of assessing the, the differences between students. Um, and so these form of tests are possibly not the best way of doing what people think that they do. And it creates all sorts of interesting things about US and, and racial disparities and economic disparities and, and all those kind of things. Mm. So in terms of not relying on the SAT or the ACT, probably a good thing. It does, however, open up issues in that it was a good indication both to us as counsellors and, and loads of colleagues on, on the here from schools as well, off to how serious a student was about going to the US. Equally also for admissions counsellors, that the fact that students had taken the test was a good sign of you know, whether the students actually were serious about going to college. Um, mm. So you could say it did that. Um, and it does create challenges. I mean, I think the two reasons why in the UK context, the test optional is responsible for those growth numbers is that firstly, you yeah we all know we would have students who are very very high achieving on GCSEs A levels IB etc but just never got the test score that was commensurate to it mm. um, and so then just, you would end up with a situation of their parents would come into the situation of we will go to the US and pay for it if it's one of these 15 20 colleges they don't get a test score that's appropriate for that so they don't bother applying was this year they still applied or it's those students who just assume it works on a UCAS timeline and rock up in September and go, yeah, I can apply to the US now. Um, and this is where you and I get nice emails from many of our friends on the call here, Jason, saying, can you help? And normally we just said, Look, no chance, don't don't bother. It was this year, you could actually say, well, I don't think it's the wisest move. You haven't done any preparation for this, but actually there's nothing stopping you from applying to some of these universities. Mm, interesting. Uh, and the other one um, is Biden. Uh, Obviously, Biden was elected after the application round had started last year. Um, but anecdotally, at least, this seems to have had quite a positive effect on international students. Um, obviously, US students are still going to be applying to college, regardless of who's in power, although I'm sure some would have tried to escape the country. Um, but uh, internationally, at least, um, there's been very um, positive signs. I, I think personally, I think one of the things is, is suddenly the um, the removal of the fear about the status of international students in the US. Um, uh, how much of an effect do you think it's had on people just being willing to apply to the US, David? I think it, you can't say it's had no effect. Mm. I haven't seen any with the students and schools that I work with, but I'm conscious that's possibly a relatively narrow band. Um, so it must have had some. I'm not sure whether it's a huge amount. Um, but then I'm always, you know, surprised when we, you know, there are colleges that I would never have students apply to. And then when Fulbright College Day was going along, you find these colleges with massive queues and obviously different parts of the US sector appeal to different students. And they, it, it could very well be an issue that we're just not seeing. Mm, interesting. And do we think it's going to continue? So do we think that next year there will be just as many UK students applying to the US? Um, as this year, or do we think it's going to even out? What do we think will happen? I think there will be um, for for two other factors that we haven't had this previous cycle. Mm. Um, I think we are seeing Brexit start to unfurl itself a little bit in terms of the settled, pre-settled status thing. Um, there will be more EU students in the UK, some of whom haven't got home fee status in the UK, so it changes the financial game. The other one is the 
very misleading articles we're starting to see in broadsheet newspapers about you know pick a, a, a well-known English um, boarding school you know Oxbridge numbers are down and therefore we're sending more of our kids to the Ivy League um, and so some of this misinformation there was a horrible story in the Telegraph a couple of weeks ago which referred to a, a three-year Ivy League degree costing £100,000 um, you know wrong on so many different counts um, but those stories are out there and so I think as the Oxbridge demographics change, the UCAS demographics change, there will be more and more schools looking. And I, you had them, Jason, I've had them the same. School was saying, oh, yeah, well, I've been told by my head to build a, a US programme. Can I have a chat with you for 45 minutes and know how to do it? Yeah, that sort of stuff is coming through. Yeah, I agree. I think that there's lots of long term reasons that the US will continue to be popular um, or rather more popular than, than the UK. Okay. Um, okay well let's uh, move on to the next point which is about um applicants to the big name colleges so we've already talked about this a few times um uh, so we know that the early rounds um at places like harvard were up 60 percent in some cases um why do we think that the early round was so much higher was it, is there a good reason for that um i think people were that tends to be the places that are most desirable for students who possibly be a little speculative. You know, if you're going to chuck your hat in the ring, it's likely going to be something that your family perceive as being better than what they might be able to get in the UK. So mm. there's, there's that element of it in there as well. Um, and I think people are starting to work out that applying early is the way to get in. Yeah, okay. Um, and then even in regular rounds, we had colleges that, it, it, sometimes in surprising cases, I think we all knew that the big name colleges were going to be up quite a lot. Um, because of these speculative applications but then places like Colgate, Liberal Arts College, wh why do places like that suddenly have so many more applications? Yeah I mean I think this might be a slight outlier and there have been cases over the last five six years where there's just been a sudden random surge in places. Mm. Uh, Colgate's a great school I mean yeah. the, the rumour says that actually Colgate was the one that should have been the eighth Ivy League rather than Brown but it was too far to sit on a bus to play American football games, so they asked Brown to halfway between <laughs> Harvard and Yale. I mean, I don't know how much truth there is, but that's the urban legend. Yeah. So it's not as if it's a you know a, an odd school to be popular. I think there's an interesting thing with a lot of schools in that kind of range where they fall as a lot of people's reach, but also a lot of people's safety. Mm. And I think it's really interesting if you are a student who may be competitive for a top 15, 20 college in the US. Colgate could be a nice, easy, fairly straightforward application essay safety. But there are a bunch of kids who may also this year have aspired to places possibly not quite as selective as Colgate and thought this year, you know what, I'll give it a go. And so possibly they get hit both ways. Interesting. Um, and, uh, and just the sheer numbers are quite incredible at some places. I mean, NYU numbers have always been creeping up over the last few years, but this year they, they hit that magic number. Um, I went uh, over Lisa's here with some clever accounting. They hit that magic number. <laughs> um, but and then places like UCLA, almost one hundred and fifty thousand applicants, which is yeah. which is quite astonishing. twice the number of applicants who apply to University in Ireland, just to UCLA. Yeah, and it, I mean it's more than half the total number of applicants throughout the whole of UCAS, yeah. um, and that's just to one university, which is quite astonishing. Um, I, I mean, let's just talk about that for a moment. How? I mean, I mean maybe we should have. Um, someone like Lisa joining us right now, but how on earth does a university like that um, deal with that number of applications? What are they doing to, yeah. to get through it in time? Well, I mean, UCLA is, a, is an interesting one, that they have an army of external readers. Mm. Um, so UCLA do um, you know, have a bunch of people, so they hire more. Um, and bear in mind, it costs you about $70 a pop to apply to UCLA. You can just work out how much money they made. It doesn't cost that amount of money to run the admissions process. So there's that element. But yeah, I mean, there was an article in the Duke student newspaper I saw at some point in the last week. And they interviewed an admissions officer talking through how they managed to do this. And they worked a huge number of hours. Um, Lisa just posted something in, in the, the chat to us as well, Lisa from NYU saying the same, yeah. Um, some colleges gave themselves another two weeks to do it. Um, but I feel for, for people, if suddenly your workload increases by a third, that, that's not fun. No. um yeah tough well this uh, this is why I, it, 
the, the test scores were actually quite useful for universities in terms of reducing their initial workload. And that it was quite an easy way to filter people out initially um, on, on a single metric. Um, now, NYU, of course, has always been test flexible anyway. Um, so you didn't have to submit those test scores. And now it just means that for a lot of those other colleges, they're dealing with those sorts of numbers. And like you said, having to do an awful lot of, a lot of reading, a lot of essays. Um, and this has meant that the admit rates at some places are now incredibly low. I mean, they were already low enough at places like Stanford and Chicago. Uh, but now we're seeing places heading down to the, um, well, um, single figures and close to close to zero percent at some places. Um, and I mean, this just makes it, it incredibly difficult for uh, for people to to know what they've got to do to increase their chances. So, I mean, how how do we advise families and students um, when they've got their heart set on places with admit rates that are about 10 times harder than Oxford and Cambridge? Yeah, well, get, get your heart set on something else. I mean, that's the slightly <laughs> blunt but first thing about it. I, I have a line that I use for years and years in this. And this if you got were sitting on a plane on the tarmac at Heathrow flying off to the US and they said there's a 5% chance of this landing on the other side, you'd get off the plane. And obviously this is a different, different thing here than sitting on an aeroplane, but when you think about it in that way, in terms of chances, you've, you've got to go into thinking this is almost certainly not going to happen. And if you go into it at that point of view, yes, you can give it your best job, it's not going to happen, then it's a healthy process. Where it's unhealthy, and we saw this with the Rick Singer scandal, is when people prize this thing so much, and it has just deleterious effects on families and school cultures and the mental health of young people. Um, there are three ways to give yourself a shot at getting into one of these unbelievably hyper, hyper selective schools. You are recruited as an athlete for that university. And we know that is a game changing thing. There's a great blog from UES, Jason, that you wrote, it went up today about that kind of angle. Um, you have unbelievable legacy with the university. Um, you know, family members have gone there and been very involved in whatever way that might look like, and that's gonna give you a better chance. Or, you turn up and lo and behold, the new dormitory has your family's name on it because uh, I mean, at, at some of these universities, we're talking a six figure, you know, seven figure donation to make this just realistic in terms of what we're talking about, possibly even more. So, and if you're not in that category, then it's a crapshoot. I mean, it literally is, you do your best and you are admissible. And sometimes I think there should be a certificate that's given out to students saying, congratulations, you are good enough to apply to these places. Um, but other than that, we don't know. And, and one of the really important things to understand, and I say this a lot to, to the families we work with, is you don't know whether you were cut after the first read or mm. you were the person taken off 10 minutes before because suddenly they need to lose five names. And you don't know. And it makes no difference, really. And if you can't cope with that process and understanding that, then this is probably not the thing to go and do. Yeah, I think that's right. And we'll, we'll give that very advice at the end as well, just talking about how unlikely it is and how you've got to be um, realistic and, and, and not get your heart set on these sorts of places because the likelihood is that no matter what anyone does to help you, apart from those reasons you've just said, um, you are probably not getting in and that's the way you have to approach it. Um, I'm not sure I like your analogy about um, taking off on a plane. But I think utility values there are slightly different. Um, I wouldn't take off on a plane that had a 5% chance of crashing, let alone a 95% chance. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, third one is lots of students on wait lists. So obviously we're seeing that at the moment. Um, I know if there are counsellors on the call, every single one will have students on wait lists hoping about now that they're going to start hearing from colleges. Um, and I, I think we've, we've seen students who in a normal year might not have been um, might not might normally have been admitted straight away now put on wait lists for colleges that we might not be expecting i think some of those reasons are fairly obvious more applicants um, but also fewer places because lots of students had deferred their places from full um this year to full next year so those students who were in the round before um were given the option to defer in, at some universities when they might not normally have been able to defer. Did you see many people deferring, David? Um, yes, we had a couple, actually. Um, actually, people who tried to start asynchronously um, mm. and then they couldn't make it work, you know, particularly if time differences were crazy. 
Mm, okay, so people who were going to who were faced with doing online learning. Yeah, they they you know decided that it was worth it. They would give it a go. Did two or three weeks of it, and thought no, and then requested a referral. Um, okay. yeah. yeah. So obviously that means there were fewer places, but more applicants in the last round. Um, so it's made it doubly hard for everyone. Um, and that's why I think we've seen lots of people ending up on wait lists. Traditionally, universities use wait lists um, to try and make sure that um, they can fill up all their places. So you, the students, the, the, and we'll come on to this in a moment, the colleges will be trying to estimate how many of the places, the people they offer places to will say yes. And then they use their wait list to try and add to that um, if, um, if they're under. Now, some places use wait lists very, very heavily, sometimes cynically to improve their... Um, uh, or lower their admit rates and um, some places will use it quite honestly um, just to ensure that they can make sure that they fill up all their places. Um, is there anything else you want to say about wait lists actually David? Before we yeah go? so I mean it's the same in like UCAS with near miss offers. Universities have a metric to fit which is physical beds on campus that's what they're trying to hit and it's a problem there's a great article I think from about this time last year Virginia Tech got the numbers really wrong and had to buy a hotel because you just need more beds. I mean, that, that is a challenge. Um, and so the aim is to come in low, and then like in the UCAS on confirmation day, you take your near misses, so then you can mm -hmm. hit your metric. Um, and on this, you try and come in so you are not hundreds of people over, and then you have accommodation issues. You know, you can buy more books, you can hire adjunct professors, you can double up, you know, start lectures at seven in the morning. You can do all those things in university. You can't easily find more beds. Um, the problem is all the metrics of projecting what do we need to be doing you know how many offers do we make how do we track students things and this is again where test optional is an issue without testing how do you use those metrics as to how serious people are um you know when were the test scores sent to you if you've got a test score that was sent automatically to a student who was in, from the lower six and they've gone to your college early it's a good sign that that student is interested in you so all those kind of things are, are off so the wait list is a is a big deal. I think there's a couple of other messages that's important for people to know. A wait list isn't necessarily something that you should be celebrating within your school. Some colleges have two or three times more students on wait lists than they've made offers to. So it doesn't mean there's like a list of 50 people and you're definitely going to get off it. Um, they are waitlisting as a courtesy. You know, if you are the third student from that family applied to that university, and the family have been donating, they'll waitlist you rather than say no because they don't want that kind of impact on things if you're from a high profile family these kind of things it's an easier thing um the waitlisting's also got to depend on actually who might be able to get there so last year students with u.s passports got off waitlist much more easily than anyone else did because they didn't need a visa getting visas is still complicated in various parts of the world now i mean the news recently the russia the u.s embassy in russia is being um radically reduced in terms of what's able to do so Russian kids getting off wait lists who need visas from Russia, that's not probably going to happen because they might, you can often swap the wait list, but they won't get a visa to come. The final thing I think it's important to understand on, on wait lists is these tiny colleges, the ones that are really trying to curate an incoming class of a, you know, a couple of thousand or fewer people, they're not going to replace an engineer from India with an interest in rugby with a classicist from Nigeria with an interest in the flute. They are going to try and replace like for like. Mm. So that's why these waitlists can be so massive because it's not like they've got listed one to 2,000 who they want to take. They will try and be filling things that keep the kind of process of, of how they want the class to look, including money, to be perfectly honest, of how much you know, tuition revenue they're bringing in. Always say to students on waitlists, if you want to you know, be on one, that's fine, but you've got to then assume you're going somewhere else. Mm. You can't hold on to the hope that you're going to get off the waitlist because you probably won't. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I mean, do we think that uh, that many of the students who are sitting on waitlist at the moment? I mean, what what would we get if someone asked what what's the probability that I'm going to get off the waitlist? What would you say to them? Very low. Assuming that you're not going to. I mean, I, if I was asked that, I would say very low. It might be higher, but I think there's only sensible advice to give is very low. Mm. Colleges start going to waitlists two weeks ago in some places. I mean, Barnard moved very early. Um, mm. So it's interesting as to what's going to happen, um, mm. but you can't you can't predict it. You you, no. you can't sit here thinking you know, I'm going to reject everything else. I'm going to have nowhere else to go because I'm going to get off this waitlist. You probably won't. Yeah, and you have to remember that of course they will be taking people off the waitlist right up until August as well, um, because 
we, there are always points at which people turn around who have paid deposits suddenly decide they're not going to come. Um, and certainly we've seen that before where students will pay the deposit but still wait for other wait lists. And if they get off that wait list, they're going to go. And then that place, the other wait list comes open. Um, so don't despair, but um, it does seem unlikely. Yeah. Uh, oversubscribed colleges. So just what you were saying, David, um, some colleges have got this wrong. Uh, so USC, we found out today, admitted something like 675 more people than they thought they were going to. So they are oversubscribed and they now have to honour all of those. Um, it, how on earth did that happen? What has gone on there? You know, it was more popular than, than they thought it was going to be. At some point, someone's got to make a, a guess in this process. And they're extraordinarily expensive consultancy companies that help universities do this kind of stuff. And, and mm. it's more your line of work, Jason, to maths than, than, than mine here, but modelling. Um, someone gets it wrong. I mean, it's, it, it's going to happen and they've got to make it work now for these students. You, you would imagine there will be some very generous offers to defer to the spring or next year. Um, to some of those students. Um, and bear in mind, probably doesn't fall equally across the different bits of a college like USC. You know, it could be that Marshall is down and Viterbi is up. Um, mm. You know, we'll wait to see. But yeah, I mean, it, and they will again, almost certainly have probably tried to come in under. Um, yeah. But it happens. I mean, good luck to, to Nathan and Alex and the team. Well, they've done a good job in getting so many people to apply. Um, but uh, USC, notoriously a very difficult college to get into anyway. Um, it was probably more difficult than ever to get into this this year, um, but yet they've still managed to um, admit more people than they thought. So hopefully they won't. Yeah, well, I'd say they they would probably yeah they've admit more people deposited than they thought from the number that they admitted. So. Yeah, they might be crossing their fingers now that those people don't turn up. But um, yeah, uh, I mean, this the thing, I follow a lot of admissions officers on on, on social media and have, have a lot of sort of friends in that. And it's fascinating because you kind of seen a lot of things over the last sort of week coming to May the 3rd of people looking at their dashboards on their CRMs, seeing the deposits roll in. And some people will have been very happy with what was coming in and some people will be fearing for their jobs because um, people can watch this data in real time. Mm. I think um, what you were saying about data there is, is worth just touching on. There is this um, notion of yield modeling, modeling. So yield is obviously the rate at which people say yes um, when they're offered a place. Um, and it, it's not as simple as universities offering exactly the people they want or the places and those people saying yes, because of course people are, might be holding several offers and thinking about where they're gonna go between them. So what the colleges do is try to predict how many of the people they say yes to will actually come. How many people would pay the deposit and then ultimately how many people will turn up. Um, and that's called yield modeling. And I, I suspect that this year it has been harder than ever because there have been so many changes and the colleges have had, um, well, one major fewer metrics to, to use. I haven't been able to use test, um, uh, test scores in most cases. That's made their yield modeling a bit more difficult this year. Um, and hopefully their algorithms will improve for future yeah. years. I'll add to that the whole demonstrated interest factor, which is not every college, but if you are a college that looks at the level of interest a student has shown, really big indicators that a student would be keen to enroll, like they've actually flown and visited your college or have yeah. come to an event that you have run um, in person. I mean, we say this about USC, but Nathan for many years and now Alex have come here. Um, they have a, a you know, representative in the UK. So those kind of things are also that might enable them to think, right, so this student has been on campus. Mm they are therefore much more likely to take the place than the one we, we haven't had anything with. Again, it's been thrown up in the air. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I'm, I'm gonna be talking at the International ACAC conference this year about demonstrated interest. Um, and I think it's one of the um, the most, or, or the least understood topics of US admissions is how important it is to demonstrate to the university that you actually want to come for two major reasons. One is that it helps you in your initial um, chances of it being admitted. And secondly, it could help getting off the wait list because when, when colleges are taking people off the wait list, they wanna be sure that the people they're taking off are the people who are going to come. Um, so if you can demonstrate to the university that you really are that person, then that's gonna help you a lot. Not, I have a very, very long file in my resources of all the social media links and mailing list links of universities that attract demonstrated interest that students we work with are told to sign up to. And every year I get one student who's very upset because they didn't get into their safety school 
I can absolutely guarantee that they didn't do anything to demonstrate it just because they didn't think they needed to. The yeah. car just looks at their metric and goes, well, you're too good for us. And you, we, we know that you're not interested because you never opened an email we sent you. So why would we waste an offer on you? Exactly. Yeah. No, and it's uh, uh, removing the cynical aspect of it. It's actually a good thing for students to do as well, because if you follow those links and you read the newsletters and you turn up to the webinars and you visit yeah. the college, you will really understand a lot about the college and work out whether it's really the place you want to go to. Better essays. And, and then to us, it's, it's you know, like normal life. If someone's not interested in you and someone is interested in you, who are you going to be more, more amenable to? I mean, it's, it's true in life as it is in college admissions. We, we all respond to flattery, don't we? Um, OK, so what does this all mean for students? We've, we've covered a lot of the, the things just now, um, but it's more difficult than ever to get into those colleges. We know the admit rates are extremely low. Um, so that means that students need to do more to stand out. Um, David, what, what do we mean by this when we say that a student needs to stand out? I think sometimes people misunderstand this by saying, well, I've got to do even better in my A-levels or I've got to get, a, I've got to get 1600 on the SAT. Um, what else can students be doing here to stand out to the colleges? Yeah, so I, I, we do a lot of work up, as you guys all know, with students going to different countries. And we have students coming, US to UK, you take US, Ireland, Canada, Europe, etc. And it's quite hard when people are looking at this idea of gaming out. Well, when we're in our UK system, we have entry requirements. How does that work elsewhere? And something that we really want to do, and I spend a lot of time thinking about, is, is where do you fall within your cohort? And then where would you fall in a different country's cohort? Mm. So if you think about it, where do these obvious colleges in the US draw most of their students from? You take, take out the athletes and the legacies, you know, you're taking away a third, 40, 50% of the people. Who else is getting in? Yeah, at these unbelievably selective schools, you're talking about the top one, 2% of an applicant pool in not just academics, but in everything else. You know, these are students who in some metric are the top one or 2%. And that's a metric as well as their academics being the top one or two percent. So highly competitive athlete, you know, young economist, journalist, scientist, whatever they might be, they've got this other thing as well. And so when you look at the UK pool applying to these schools, what are the students who are getting in doing that put them in that same one or two percent above just their academics? So if you look at the news stories and you see it, you know, in the papers on social media and in some sort of press releases from, from schools that where the students have got into, these students have something else stand out. You know, they led a major project to help improve their local community in COVID, or they've started their own app, they're running their company, they are competing at an extraordinarily high level in things like maths, Olympiad or chess, or they're, you know, professional quality um, artists or, or musicians. It, it's that extra thing that makes the difference in terms of everything else. The other thing that I think that comes into this, and it might not just be at that, that hyper-selective group, but maybe just the tier below, is that every bit of your application doing the job for you. And that it's not just about a good essay and a good set of supplemental essays and nice references from school. It's all those bits working together to sell a consistent story that matches the colleges you're applying to. So if you're applying to Brown and you're applying to Columbia, it's impossible to spin that in the same way because you're applying to two unbelievably different curriculum structures. But if you're only applying to Columbia or other reading heavy curriculums and every single thing in your, that whole narrative the missions officers read sells all of that, then maybe you could be one of these extra people that sneaks in. But I think where we've seen all these you know, people chucking applications willy nilly is Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Stanford and MIT and Caltech basically writing a UCAS statement that's for Greek and maths and French and sustainability and PE. I mean, it's it's just generic twaddle. And though you might be able to do your su supplements for that, the bit I think is crucial right now is the teachers need to be able to write stuff as well that fits the kind of places you're going to. So if you were really, really, really serious about it, you've got to apply to a consistent list of colleges and help your teachers write references that bring out the points that those colleges are looking for in candidates. Yeah, good advice there. Um, the, the other thing is, uh, it, when you're thinking about um, academics, as I just mentioned, people always think that, you know, if they've got perfect grades, they're going to get in anywhere, but we know that isn't true. Um, and now with people not submitting test scores, they've got to be very, very aware of what where their academics might place them. So if you only got sixes and sevens in GCSEs, 
and you're hoping that your A levels with your A's and A stars are going to make up for that, um, you, you're probably going to be at a big disadvantage already applying to some of those very academic colleges. So you need to be very aware of um, where you can place your efforts and what you can do to try and convince the colleges that you're the right fit. Yeah, I mean, there's a thing that, that I would say to families who are in that situation, and obviously we don't know what they're going to get because it's predicted grades. But I, I would say, honestly, look, you might get three A stars at A level and you've got nines, eights and sevens at GCSE. I know there are students out there who will get three A stars at A level and exactly the same bit of paper that yours says, a predicted grade, and who have straight nines at GCSE. And I know that because I'm working with some of them. Hmm. And so you're already at a disadvantage against somebody else. And in a place, that, the job of admissions officers, these colleges to reject 98% of people. You know, you, you make, you're making their life easy. You know, and if you ever get, you know, councils here, you ever get a chance to come to the, some of these conferences that Jason and I have been to, buy someone a beer, buy them two or three more beers, and they'll ask them this kind of stuff. If your job was to be able to give scores on these people, to get rid of 95% of people who apply, you are going to be getting down to, this one's got a six at GCSE. There's no other way of doing it. Mm. Yeah, quite right. And, and this is one of the, the, the bad side. We were talking about the good and bad about test optional earlier. This is one of the bad side effects of it, is that they're going to be looking more closely at your score grades. Um, it doesn't make your life easier not submitting test scores. It might make it harder, especially if you've got some, some gaps there in your academics. So that's where tests could come in useful, is to, to try and plug that gap to some extent. Um, so be aware of that. Um, some of the things that are fairly obvious um but i don't think people want to admit some of these colleges that we might have called match colleges before for students are now becoming reach colleges because of the admit rates and one thing um that we've been talking about recently david is that some of these reach colleges are now unlikely um and that's to put it bluntly i i, I use the words extremely unlikely for a lot of them because as we were saying you've got to go into this process assuming that you're only going to get in with a bit of luck um, even if you are a very, very good match for that college because the admit rates are so, so low. So you can't go into it um, assuming that you are the best student and you're going to get into those places. Um, and I think it's important, especially if you're a counsellor, it's important to have these conversations early with parents and students to make sure that they're not going into this thinking um, that uh, it, they're, they're, they're a shoe in for some of these colleges. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's also... We've got to not look at this in the context of the UK. I mean, you've got UC Santa Barbara is a really good example of it. It's a really great school. If you look at it on the rankings like US News, you know, for what it's worth, it's still extraordinarily highly ranked. But people come to it and go, well, it's not UCLA and UC Berkeley. So it must be, you know, it must be a fairly likely college for me. If it was the University of Santa Barbara, it wouldn't have that kind of stuff. But people then are surprised when they get denied by this university because in their head, they might see it as being like an Oxford Brooks or an Aston, which are wonderful universities are not doing them down. But for maybe an A star student, they will possibly look down their noses a little bit at that university. But you see Santa Barbara or anything like 30th, 40th, 50th in the US is not the UK equivalent of an Oxford Brooks or an Aston in selectivity. It's the equivalent of Imperial or, or UCL in the overall scheme of where people apply to. And it's that psychology is so tricky that a student with those grades wouldn't be looking at the 30th or 40th ranked school in the UK or any other country in the world. But in the US, when the last year there were 57 colleges or universities that are more selective than Oxbridge, the 35th ranked college might still deny you, even with straight A stars at all. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very um, conscious to have this conversation with people very early now. Um, and uh, one of the, the, the examples I always give to people is that you, you can't just think about it based on the names that you know, that you've heard of. That's probably a very bad way of assessing how good a college is. Um, the, it, and a good example of this is if you ask the average American, have you heard of UCL? They've probably never heard of it. Yeah. They've probably heard of Oxford, Cambridge, maybe Imperial, and they've probably heard of St. Andrews because of Prince William. Um, and that's probably about it. Yeah. But you know, you know that UCL and KCL and, and Bristol are fantastic universities. And you would think it's mad for people to turn that down because they've never heard of it. It's he's staying the other way around. If you haven't heard of um, Santa Barbara or you haven't heard of Williams, you haven't heard of Bowdoin, it doesn't mean that these aren't some of the very best places in the entire world. Um, and it's important to just be more aware of that 
And if you are and you're comfortable with that, then you can end up at some incredible universities that far outrank um, almost all the UK universities. And I'll add this, and actually something interesting, we've got a really strong um, audience of school counsellors here. I've been having a lot of calls in the last couple of weeks about families who are wanting their child to come to the UK for sixth form. The idea is they'll pick a UK school and then we might work with them for international applications afterwards. I'm getting a lot of the stuff of, well, you know, such and such is not a top school. Now, top is being rated on proportion of people getting top IB grades or A star A at A level. And you as school counsellors know that actually a school that is, you know, only bringing in people who can get a 40 plus on the IB, is that doing a good job educationally, bringing in super smart people and churning out super smart people? We know that maybe an all round school, boarding environment, day environment that is turning students and transforming them into different things is doing a better job educationally. Well, it's the same college in the US. Yeah, there is a very strong argument been going back for many, many years that Harvard admitting the creme de la creme isn't actually doing a good job educationally if they come out also as the creme de la creme. Mm -hmm. Maybe a college that takes a B-grade student and then turns them out as a Rhodes Scholar, that's the better college. And so I think there's a whole messaging thing of, well, you've chosen our school because of this culture that we do. If you liked it here, let's find a US college that does the same kind of stuff, rather than it be it, we've just got a default into this name brand place. Mm. Okay, let's move it on. Um, it, as we've been discussing, it's more difficult to advise students now because there's more unknowns um, and because you have to have these difficult conversations earlier on. Um, but uh, it, it does certainly make it more interesting. Yes. Um, okay, let's talk about some advice then. A lot of this we've already said. Um, so first of all, students really need to choose a well-rounded list of colleges. Um, again, just applying to those very big names is probably going to be um, a surefire way of being very disappointed in this process. Um, they need to start early. So we, we've touched on this. Um, and I know that, David, you wanted to talk about the fact that um, there were very, very few students who came to this process late, actually got in, um, if if any. Do you, do you want to touch on that a bit? Yeah, I mean, I think that an awful lot of this would have been, and, and friends on the call from schools, please chime in the chat if we're getting this, this either wrong or right. But it was people just whacking in a couple of applications, you know, in the autumn term, never thought about going to the US, but now they can, so why not? And I don't see any correlation with anyone I've spoken to that those are the people that got in. The people who got in were the people who've been planning this for a while, particularly at the, obviously at the, the super select event. Um, so, yeah, it, the, even now test optional to be honest, I think it really helps us make this point you've got to know where you're applying and why you're applying. And then everything you do follows on from that kind of process. And if the only thing is it's a name place and I want to decide really last minute to have a go for it, it's not going to happen. I've said this on all the training events I've done with, with Jason and Simon at UES for many, many years, the importance of having an application agreement. As a school, having a document with all your policies and procedures that you get parents and students to sign, so you cover all those things. And I would add to that now a date by which you have to be informed that student is applying. Because to be honest, a student coming to you in mid-October saying I'm applying to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford is an awful lot of work for you when they are almost certainly not going to get in. And I think you need to have a cut-off point that, yeah, if you're applying to the US, obviously all the communications, make it some newsletters, it's emailed out to all the parents. If you're applying to top 40, top 50, whatever it is, US colleges, we can only support your application if you have informed of us this by this date. Because other than that, they're wasting their time. I really think they are. Yeah. And um, you must seriously consider your school grades. So we've just talking, been talking about the, the fact that GCSEs matter um, and just assuming that you're going to be able to apply and get into one of these um, very selective colleges is, um, it is probably barking up the wrong tree if, you, uh, um, if you're not taking this and shows that you're not taking this seriously. So you, you've really got to be careful about what your academics say about you there as well, as well as everything else. Um, and as we've been saying, you need to advise people that they need to treat these big name colleges as the next to zero chance of admission. It's always very tempting to say to people, oh, yes, of course, you know, you're a great student. You should apply to one of these places. Maybe you'll get in. That's all very well. And, and they should do. People should apply to reach colleges as long as they are also aware of um, how unlikely it is. Um, and therefore also applying to other places. If you just put applications into these hyper-selective places, you will probably be wasting time and money. 
Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that's the most powerful thing you can say to a parent is it, it's going to be a waste of your money if, you, if you're doing this and it won't be their fault, it won't be the student's fault um, and it won't be our fault. It's just the fact that it's a very, very competitive system. But as we've been saying, if you choose a well-rounded college list, first of all, you might be lucky and get into one of those hyper-selective places um, because people do um, if you're a really good fit. Um, but hopefully you'll come away from the process with offers from other universities that you are really, really pleased with and are probably universities that are um, actually in the grand scheme of things, incredibly well ranked um, yeah. in the world. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about when we were talking earlier about this, this, Jason, I think when just reflecting about the students that we work with this year, and we've had students get into some of the colleges on your list, you know, we've, from a purely marketing point of view, it's been a very good year for the university guys. We'll have a lot of names that marketing people like to sell. Um, I would rather not, but I realise that's the real world. People come to us because they think we'll help their kids get into these places. The mm -hmm. students who did get on could have taken it and left it. Yeah, the students, we've got students at Stanford and Princeton and Yale and MIT and so on and so forth. It was never the be all and end all for them. And I think that comes out. And again, the bit that we as counsellors don't have any control over is what does the school say about the student? If they are that phlegmatic, well-rounded, just I want an education kind of a student, they are probably the right fit for these universities. I don't think any of the students that we work with were, like, they were all really, really pleasantly surprised they got in to those places. Um, the ones who were really, you might be disappointed are the ones we try not to work with because it becomes a bit stressful. The other bit I'd add to this last point that Jason makes, and I agree entirely, but I think this is increasingly becoming an issue of managing within your school community as well. Because as the media stories come through, as more school heads or, or possibly worse, ambitious academic deputies who'd like to have a project which gets them their, their first headship start to pick up on this kind of stuff, you've got challenges of managing this within your community. We do a lot of work with HMC. Um, I'm doing a stuff for a bunch of agents and marketing managers later this week about this kind of messaging. Is What we are all knowing is that Harvard is not a nice backup to Oxford. But if your school community and the people marketing your school at fairs all around the world are saying this to prospective families and your teachers are saying, well, why are you planning to Wake Forest? It must be rubbish. I've never heard of it. That internal messaging is so important for students' well-being as well, because I think actually what might be happening is you might be giving the best messaging, we might be giving the best messaging, but in a community at large, parents, relatives, friends and colleagues might be the one saying, well, if you're blind to the US, why aren't you checking in Harvard? You've got yeah, straight A stars and not knowing that they're potentially setting up students for a fall. So I think that internal messaging mm -hmm. is really important too. Yeah, great point. Um, and there was a nice piece of advice from Lisa from NYU on here who just said that there is a college out there for everyone. Um, and, and that is really true. If you are understand what kind of a college suits you well, understand where you fit in terms of the people who are applying to those places, you, you, you can find an amazing college that you will really thrive at. Um, and that's when this process can become really enjoyable and life-changing. Yeah, and, did it, and it might be the UK, to be perfectly honest. You know, it might be UK. We work, have a, a process, which is unusual in my line of work as an independent council, and we have a package that just helps students build their college list. And in about 15% of cases, that goes no further because we've helped them build the list and the family have worked out that actually none of the places that they think we're students going to get into are places they want to go for. In which case, we're very happy, thank you very much, we'll stay in the UK. Mm -hmm. That's as much of a service for a family as the students celebrating because they got into Stanford. You know, because they go, you know what, let's not waste any more time and money. Thank you, university guys. We're happy with UCAS. That's, that's as healthy part of the process as even saying, I'll find other colleges in the US. Yeah, great. Okay, let's try and do our predictions then, David. Um, so... What do we think is going to happen to the numbers in this next round? So people applying for uh, 2022 entry um, or 2022 entry, yeah. yeah. Um, what do we think is uh, is going to happen? What do, do we think the admit rates are going to stay very low? Do we think the numbers of applicants are going to stay high? I think we're going to see the same, if not worse, next year um, for, for two reasons. Firstly, this year group will potentially be more disrupted than the previous year group. Um, yeah, a seriously organized student applying to the most selective US colleges but had possibly already got an SAT or an ACT in before things shut down. This year group have not. Mm. So you're then gonna have the same issue of people applying to places that they thought they might not be competitive for. 
there's that element. Add into the fact as well, there is serious instability in the two biggest markets for international students coming to the US, which are India and China. Yeah, China for the geopolitical, India because of the tragic health situation there right now. Um, and so it is not like in the UK, we're coming out of this, hopefully vaccines, everything else, it's fine. The rest of the world is not. Um, and so I think there's going to be a basically very similar cycle next year. Um, and there's going to be so many out when we start to see the stats about diversity and first year involvement in some of these colleges and stuff. Yeah, there are colleges that are going to be a fifth first generation students this year. Black Lives Matter has changed the, the diversity initiatives at some colleges as well. So more students from those demographics are going to see themselves represented in the first year class and think, OK, well, this college that I thought wasn't for me might be for me. That's good news, but it's going to mean there's the, the same, if not more people applying to these schools. The more random it becomes, the more people think they have a shot. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that is what makes it much more difficult to advise now. Okay, the other prediction is about long-term implications for international students. I mean, once the the kind of initial reper, um, repercussions of the pandemic are over, which is going to take a few years because of the students who had their GCSEs interrupted and now their A levels interrupted. Um, once that's over, what what do we think will be the kind of um, the, the trends for international students applying to the US? At some point the bubble's got to burst, hasn't it? I mean, I say this in the middle of somebody who earns their money from student mobility, but at some at some point people have got to, you know, work out it might not be what they think it is, but it doesn't seem to be. Um, I think it's going to be more complicated. I just, it is going to become an unbelievably confusing and complex process. I and mean, some of us who are on international ACAC will have seen some tragic news of a mutual friend of ours, Joan Liu, trying to find a place for a student um, who was admitted to UC Berkeley from an appalling situation, refugee status and everything, and didn't realize there wasn't gonna be any money. And now desperately trying to find situations. You know, all this complexity is gonna become more and more and more, uh, more just <laughs> off-putting for people. Um, I think the top, top, top one is that other countries are going to become places to look at. I mean, you look at the efforts that Canada's making, again, more and more and more efforts. And I think it might be a multi-country approach is becoming the norm. Yeah. Okay. And, I mean, test optional, I think we, we know that um, our predictions there are that test optional is here to stay. I think that there are still, I mean, there are a lot of people don't realize there are still hundreds of colleges that require tests. Yeah. Actually. Um, and people have got to be very careful about this in the next few years, thinking that everywhere is test optional. I think David, you and I both know a horror story about a school that um, had advised their students incorrectly, thinking that um, all the universities were test yeah. optional when they weren't and they missed out on places as a result. And it cost um, that family something like $150,000 over the next four years. Florida is not, University of Florida system is not test optional. If you've yeah. got kids looking at the University of Florida, make them check. You do not want to be in an office with a school lawyer. Yeah, exactly. Um, so do be careful with that. Uh, but, I mean, on the whole, uh, the trend is towards test optional. But um, I, I don't think that it is the end of tests by any means. Uh, certainly, we are not seeing a reduction in the numbers of people taking tests who are thinking about America. Um, Personally, I think that when things become more confusing like this, people tend to focus on those measurable quantities. Um, but it does make advising harder because there are students who should not be testing. There are times at which it becomes too late. There are other things that you could be doing um, that would have more of an impact on your applications. But equally, there are students where testing is a really good idea because there are points at which it can make up for shortfalls in other areas. Um, those students who are very, very academic can have got something tangible they can use to prove that they're academic. Uh, and David, just before this call, you were mentioning um, about particular subjects like STEM subjects and how important testing has been for them. Do you want to touch on that? Yeah, so it, it trailed in a newsletter from Jeff Salingo last week, and we haven't seen the data yet, but he's always obviously trying to sell his books and stuff. But he's pretty well connected, an American journalist, um, with the most seminal book um, of the last year or so about college emissions, um, saying that it seemed, when you're looking at some of the stats that he's had access to, for colleges of arts and sciences on the whole, it seems like the colleges admitted the same proportion of people who... Um, 
who apply without testing. So if you had 30% of the people apply with testing, 30% of the people who got in were the people who, who had tested. But in STEM, maybe it's applying to a college of engineering or a college of business, it doesn't seem to be like that. Basically, having extra proof of your ability in maths and, and maybe you know, some sciences did make a difference in terms of your chances of getting in. Now, I have nothing more than Jeff's newsletter to say that, right? but he's very well regarded. And I would say there's possibly something in that as well. Um, I mean, there's no difference to Cambridge admissions for maths. You know, 50% of the people who get an offer don't get it because they do the extra step test. You know, if you're good at maths, they'd like to know how good are you at maths. I think it, it makes logical sense. It does make sense. Can I chuck one more into the prediction here? And it might not be next year, but something for future years is to watch what California does with testing. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, for those who don't know, California, or at least the UC system, is currently test blind. Um, looks like that's going to uh, continue for a few more years, maybe before they introduce their, uh, their own tests um, that they were supposed to take 10 years over an hour, only going to take about four or five years, apparently. Yeah. Um, it, that's obviously affected quite a number of students, particularly from California who are applying to university, uh, and in that they don't even need to do tests for those universities. But um, uh, I mean, what do you think is going to be the implication on the... Or, well, it's the thing, I mean, we obviously perceive this from an international viewpoint, but I think we've got to remember that American universities are designed for American kids. Um, and it's, I forget, it's like 12, 15, 18%, something like that number of students going to college in the US or in one of the two state systems in California. So it is that old phrase, you know, when California sneezes, America catches a cold. You know, if a system is educated in that many students introduces a completely new test, then other places are going to do it, particularly if your college is the recruits from California. So we'll watch this space as it changes, because if it seems likely there is a new test, Jason, hopefully you're out there negotiating the sale of the UES diagnostic to the state of California, <laughs> then, um, you know, there will be new things that come in from it. So as ever with US advising, and that's why we get on so well and why we all love doing the work that we do, Having your ear to the ground or reading the newsletters that we pump out to you guys about this kind of stuff is, is crucial because th that nuance is always going to be there. I think California is going to be a really interesting thing over the next couple of years. Mm. Um, yeah, I sometimes wonder if there's a really simple test um, that would have the same effect out there, like um, burying a secret word in some long web page and seeing if people spot it. And the ones who do, they're the ones who get in. Simple better than the test of bank balance, which is unfortunately what some of it seems to be. And that is true. Um, okay, great. So we're just about done. Um, we have got some questions already, so we will answer them. In the meantime, here are our contact details. Um, you can always get hold of me or anyone else from my team, info at ueseducation.com. Uh, David is the university guy, um, and there's his email address too. Most people here don't know how to get hold of me already. I'd be very surprised. Yeah, just don't. Just Google David, that's it, you can find it. Um, okay, we've got a question here from Alex from Brighton College. Uh, a very stupid basic question. There are no stupid questions, Alex, only stupid people. Sticking not um, for you, Alex. Very stupid basic question, but I, I think I have said well-rounded list about a million times to my pupils and they stare blankly despite my advice to use Unifrog, research location, look up professors or experts in their chosen fields and see where they work, teach, anything else that we are advising pupils to help them work concretely concretely on this well-rounded list? Um, it's a great question. It, it is difficult when you say to students, you've got to choose your colleges carefully and have a well-rounded list, but they don't know what that means. And they come back yeah. with a list of five of the eight Ivy League universities. Um, what do you do, David, if you're trying to get a student to work on this process them, themselves? So two answers to that. The first one is the lovely joy of being an independent counsellor is that sometimes you can say no, um, which is different when I was a school counsellor, we have to counsel everybody. And, and so that is the ability to actually say, look, I don't think this is going to be a healthy process for us to work together. Hmm. The second thing is, is what, what I call the Volkswagen Skoda issue, in that I would go and buy a Skoda because I know it's a Volkswagen just with a slightly less salubrious badge on it, and I'll save the money, I'll get a better deal. But some people would never drive a Skoda, they'd drive a Volkswagen, possibly they would never drive a Volkswagen. And if the whole culture of that family is, you know, everything that they're hearing, everything they've been brought up with, is that the badge, the name, prestige, eliteness, whatever you call it, if that matters, then there is nothing you're going to do as a counsellor. 
to change them that this stuff matters. You are never going to convince them. Even if they say it on a call, they're walking out and saying, we're going to do the opposite. Um, and you look at actually the Varsity Blues documentary on Netflix, that just stands testament to it, of the, some of the conversations that were happening about some of the best, most well-paid high school counselors in the US. Families were still paying money to this guy you know, to cheat their way into colleges. If that is the case, you're never going to change their mind. So, so cover yourself. Have the email written saying, I've advised you to do this. This is not a strategy that I would advise. This is likely to not lead to, to any offers because your list is not tailored. And make sure that your colleagues, if it's not yourself, who do UK applications, get those, those in as well. Um, and that's just where the case, you have to protect the integrity of your cohort and yourself. Um, because you can say it till, till the cows come home, but if the family believe that a Volkswagen is better than a Skoda, then they'll believe that Harvard is better than Wake Forest. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, some practical tips for, for choosing them. I, I mean, I'm always very keen to tell students, go away and attend some, um, some talks or webinars or virtual tours of randomly selected universities and just see what you think about them. Don't think about name or anything like that. Just see what you think about them and work out and just write down and tell me what things you liked and didn't like about those places. So it kind of removes the idea of name from the process, but um, allows them to try and focus on the things that are interesting to them. When it comes to actually selecting a well-rounded list, uh, there are some practical things you could do, like um, uh, tell them that they have to come back to you with um, 10 universities that have an admit rate of less than 25%. 10 that have less than 50% and 10 that have less than 75%. It's a very, very crude measure of uh, reach, match and safety, but it will open their eyes to places that are um, slightly less selective. Um, if they've just got ones that are less than 25%, you're only really applying to Oxford and Cambridge all the way through. Um, so if you can do that and just say that's your homework, then at least they've got some, some different options there. Yeah. Um, and if they're fine with that, then okay but you've got to have a plan elsewhere yeah exactly uh, another tool that um is quite good to use particularly for counselors is um the big future tool on college board um just because it allows you to to select down by selectivity quite easily um so you can quickly find some other colleges there that might be more appropriate um okay a question here uh, from lonnie um uh, he liked, she liked what you said about setting a deadline agreement with the schools, the latest point they should allow students to apply to the US. Um, what do you think is the latest sensible time someone might decide to make a US application in the upcoming cycle? Um, so I, I, it depends if they're going for this top tier, hyper elite, super selective, whatever it is, highly rejective. So my friend Akil Bello has, taught, has termed some of these places, which I think is great, highly rejective. If it's that, then I think you need to have an earlier deadline than other places um because of the level of competition i mean i have these discussions with schools sometimes that maybe you should be actually limiting the number of your students who can apply to particular colleges uh it's so countercultural to the uk way of doing it um i would say for that kind of stuff you you want something before the summer holiday yeah but you've obviously you've got to trail that you've got to have a whole messaging plan to get that out but i said before the summer holiday if it is not oh you know we know there are plenty of awesome in us colleges which would be desperate to get your wonderful students um, that maybe can be later, but if it is, and the same way as you have your Oxbridge process, I'm sure your Oxbridge coordinators at school have a date, date by which you need to have identified whether you're in or out or not. And so before you go on some holidays, a pretty good, good way of doing it. If it's going to, maybe the rule is if it's a college, which is a, a reject rate of 90% or more, then we need to know before you go on some holiday. That feels like a pretty decent rule of thumb. Okay, great advice. Um, right, a question here from um, Lisa from NYU. Uh, what do you think we admission staff should improve in terms of encouraging or discouraging students to apply to our fairly selective institutions? Lisa, you do not need to do anything to encourage people to apply to NYU. Too many people apply already. Um, I, I can think of lots of ways you can discourage people, but I'm not sure how many of them the university would really pay for. Um, I, I think you know, you are at a university that does an awful lot of outreach um, uh, and a lot of um, product placement um, in a good way as well. So the brand of NYU is very, very well known. Um, I, I think in terms of um, overall messaging, um, I think there's a, a lot of colleges that could uh, do more outreach internationally um, to let students know that um, they are just as selective as other colleges um, that they might have heard of and um, 
explain what sort of students end up going there. Um, but, but that costs money, and that's why it's difficult for those colleges to do it. Um, David, can you pinpoint anything that's... Um... I mean, I would say, you know, I've had wonderful experiences with NYU, um, with, you know, Bobby Fernando, who many of us will know works at NYU and sort of look after the UK stuff, of taking students to see Bobby at a fair and her telling them to her face, because I teed up, just telling the kid not to apply. You've got to be in a very strong position, both professionally within your institution and the institution generally, to feel comfortable enough to say that, because we know in a lot of places the admissions office is a major source of income on application fees. I think a sense on information in view books and, and websites and stuff of the typical profile of a student getting in would be really good. I really like what the Canadian universities do, which is where they have what the minimums are, which is obviously a legal thing, but then they also have what was a standard grade profile in the previous year. Now that's going to start to move the US to an entry requirements model, which is just not going to go, go and be. But some kind of informal sense that we all know as counselors and this kind of stuff of what are the sort of great profiles that get a student in, you know, just in the room for consideration would be really, really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. But anything else is going to require major systemic reform about it. Um, I'm afraid with anything else to do with the US, I hate saying this, but it's the truth. If it was easy, I wouldn't have a job. You yeah. know, it's about time and resourcing as counsellors to be able to learn enough about it to get a sense of where students do and don't get in or not based on the context of the UK. Mm. I would say um, to those colleges, um, ask us to run mock admissions events for you. That will tell students a lot about your university very quickly. Okay, there are no other questions, David, um, and I know that you have to run, so um, we'll round it off there. So I just want to say thank you very much to everyone for tuning in and listening. And um, uh, thank you very much, David, for offering your advice. Thank you, for, thank you Jason. No, thank you. And um, everyone listening, there will be plenty more events coming up. If you check our website, ueseducation.com forward slash events, um, you will see uh, lots of events on there. For teachers, we've got our annual conference coming up on the 7th of June that David will be presenting at. In person. Um, in person. Well, he'll be in person, at least, yeah. Uh, so we'll, we might buy him a, a wrap for lunch or yeah. something. And um, and then we've got our teacher training day on uh, Monday, 20th September as well. Everything's coming around very quickly. Uh, but until then, thank you very much for tuning in and hope to see you all again soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Jason. Bye-bye.